Hey everyone! So today we'll be talking about some of the important people in Rachmaninoff's life and how they impacted him personally and or helped shape his music. Because as much as Rachmaninoff had that independence of spirit, he could not have achieved all that he did if not for the influence and the support of those around him. And I think it's important to give them some recognition. Also, they have interesting stories, so there's that too. Today we'll be talking specifically about Rachmaninoff's parents, his grandmother, his piano teacher Nikolai Zarev, and his mentor and idol Tchaikovsky. This video will probably be a part one out of I don't know how many, but some of the other ones I am hoping to get to are the Satin and Scalon families, who Rachmaninoff was really close with, Marietta Shagunyan, his pen pal and confidant, and Leo Tolstoy, yes you heard that right, and the whole lot of good he did for Rachmaninoff's self-image. But that is for later, so without further ado, I hope you enjoy the video and thank you for watching. Rachmaninoff was born in 1873 to an aristocratic family that had a background in both music and the military. Military. His mother was the daughter of an army general. His father had had a position in the military, but resigned early so he could manage the estates that he had acquired through his wife's dowry. Both of his parents also played piano. Aside from this, they had practically opposite personalities. His mother was very strict and imposed a rigid schedule on the kids, one that Rachmaninoff would adopt later in life. His father, on the other hand, was easygoing, didn't take things very seriously, and spoiled his children. And for this reason, Rachmaninoff liked him better. But he also had a very lavish lifestyle and liked to gamble. And due to his incompetence with money, combined with estate agents who stole from him, as well as the end of serfdom in Russia, and therefore the end of an important source of labor for the upper classes, the Rachmaninoff family had to sell their estates one by one. By 1882, when Rachmaninoff was around 9 or 10, the family had moved into a small flat in St. Petersburg to live with Rachmaninoff's maternal grandmother. The expensive military career that Rachmaninoff's dad had originally wanted for him was also no longer an option, and it was decided that he would study music. His dad left the family for Moscow, his mom apparently still loved his dad, so she kind of retreated inward away from her kids, and the resulting lack of emotional security was what left Rachmaninoff longing for a loving family, which was very important to him as a teenager with the Satin and Scallon families, which we will get to probably in part two. Grandmother Bukatova was a church-going lady and would often bring Rachmaninoff along with her. As a kid, Rachmaninoff wasn't very religious, though later in life that would change. Instead, what impacted him the most was the music that he heard while at church. A feature of Russian Orthodox chants was the stepwise motion of the melodies, with consecutive notes usually being only a half or a whole step apart, along with the free rhythm of the chants. And this meandering nature of the melodies would go on to be a key feature in Rachmaninoff's own compositions. He also loved the sound of the church bells, which would manifest itself in his works both with literal bells and the imitated tolling of bells. And now back to Grandma Bukatova, who, aside from playing a significant role in his development as a composer, also spoiled him to pieces. And since neither of his parents was really looking out for him either, Rachmaninoff could basically do whatever he wanted. Instead of doing his homework, he would go out and partake in his favorite activities, which included included ice skating and jumping on and off moving streetcars. He actually did okay in school, getting by on natural talent and faked report cards, until in 1885 when he failed his general education finals and risked getting kicked out of the St. Petersburg Conservatory. His mother appealed, and eventually it was arranged for Rachmaninoff to study in Moscow under a more vigilant teacher. During this last summer, Grandma Bukatova bought an estate named Borosovo just for Rachmaninoff, who spent a happy couple of months swimming, canoeing, tobogganing down the dining room table, and listening to the nearby church bells. At Borosovo, he would also play piano for his friends and neighbors, he would improvise and make stuff up, then tell them it was a famous piece by Chopin or Beethoven. When the summer was over and Rachmaninoff had to leave for Moscow, he bid a tearful goodbye to his grandmother, who then sold Borisovo because after all, she had bought it just for him. Nikolai Zarev was Rachmaninoff's piano teacher beginning in 1885, and this was where his serious musical training actually began. 
Rachmaninoff lived in Zarev's house along with two other students, a practice that wasn't as unusual as we might think today. He was a very strict and perhaps by today's standards restricting teacher in exchange for lessons and housing that were free of charge. Rachmaninoff and the other students were kept away from their families so that Zarev was the only authority that they would respond to, something that reinforced Rachmaninoff's need for a loving family and emotional attachment. As a piano teacher, Zarev was very adamant about his students having flawless technique. They practiced three hours a day, watched over by Zarev's sister who lived with them and was also very strict. Interestingly enough, Zarev himself never actually demonstrated at the piano, so people were kind of left to wonder how well he could actually play, but apparently he was a good teacher, so... Beyond piano, Zarev also educated them in a range of other subjects. He taught them about literature, French, and German, passed on his own impeccable social skills, and most importantly, introduced them to the greater circle of famous artists in Russia. He took them to see concerts, opera, and theater, and on Sundays he would have guests over. Those on the list included Tchaikovsky and the pianist Anton Rubinstein, who had a significant impact on Rachmaninoff's own playing. The students would perform for these guests and receive constructive criticism, which both helped their playing and gave them encouragement. Zarev also hired someone to play forehand piano arrangements of cornerstone chamber and symphonic music so that his students would have a well-rounded knowledge of Western classical music. Rachmaninoff generally enjoyed the years he spent at Zarev's because of how much music he was surrounded by, and it seems that this rigorous education also helped shape his personality. Whereas before, he was rather undisciplined and would scrape by on raw talent, as a young adult, Adult, he became more serious and appreciative of hard work, a mindset that remained with him throughout his entire life. However, he and Zarev did not always agree, especially on which aspect of music he should focus on for his career. Rachmaninoff wanted to be a composer, but Zarev said he shouldn't waste his talent as a pianist. Spoiler, he ended up doing both. He was at first primarily a composer, then after leaving Russia in 1917, he was mainly a concert pianist as well as a conductor. But during this time, Rachmaninoff was still living at Zarev's house, where there was only one music room. Every time that he wanted to use the piano to compose, there would be somebody else there already practicing. Rachmaninoff asked Zarev to help him get his own piano, but apparently he wasn't able to properly explain himself, so his request turned into a full-blown conflict, ending with Zarev refusing to speak to him for several months, and also arranging for him to live with his cousins, the Satin family. Rachmaninoff and Zarev eventually reconciled after the successful premiere of Rachmaninoff's opera, Aleko, where Zarev gave Rachmaninoff a gold watch that, although he had to pawn several times because he needed money, he always managed to get back and kept it with him until he died. Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, yes, THE Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, was one of Rachmaninoff's personal heroes who both influenced his compositional style and helped him out in the business side of things. Rachmaninoff was first introduced to Tchaikovsky's music by his older sister Yelena, who was a fantastic singer in her own right and who Rachmaninoff sometimes accompanied while she sang. In terms of musical influence, Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff shared that same sense of emotional appeal, sometimes called melancholy or pessimism. Tchaikovsky Tchaikovsky also provided a precedent for some of the more unusual things that Rachmaninoff would do with his works. For example, when Rachmaninoff was composing his choral symphony, The Bells, he said it wasn't weird to end on a sad movement, rather than the usual triumphant final movement, because Tchaikovsky had already done the same thing in his sixth symphony. On the practical side of things, Tchaikovsky also used his status as a musical superstar to help boost Rachmaninoff's career. He would put Rachmaninoff's pieces on the same concert program as his own, and the way he did this was by asking Rachmaninoff whether he would mind if their works were performed together. He also gave Rachmaninoff advice on how to publish his works, and at the premiere of Rachmaninoff's Aleko, Tchaikovsky made sure that the public opinion was in favor of Rachmaninoff by leaning out of his box and applauding like there was no tomorrow. Because if Tchaikovsky thought a piece was good, then it was probably pretty darn good. When Tchaikovsky died in 1893, 
either of cholera or other reasons, Rachmaninoff was personally grieved. Tchaikovsky had been an important source of encouragement and had had faith in Rachmaninoff as one of the rising stars of the musical world, this self-confidence being something that Rachmaninoff seriously lacked later in life. His career also suffered because the pieces that would have been made popular under Tchaikovsky sort of faded out away from the public ear and didn't get the widespread acclaim that they might have. To pay his respects to his mentor, Rachmaninoff wrote an elegiac trio modeled after the one that Tchaikovsky had written following the death of Nikolai Rubinstein, and gave it the same dedication in memory of a great artist. So yeah, there you have it. A few of the influential people in Rachmaninoff's life, as well as a sort of biography on his childhood. We saw some of the early influences of his compositional style, as well as the early stages of his development as a pianist. Like I said, there's lots more to come that I'll talk about in part two. I think the most interesting part of all this is seeing all the famous people that Rachmaninoff knew personally, and how all of their lives overlapped. Also really interesting in doing the research for this video, was seeing the primary sources that these people left behind. You get letters, interviews, other people's stories and impressions. In the Riesman biography, you have Rachmaninoff thinking back on his life and telling it in his own words. You get actual photos of him doing like regular human stuff, like, I don't know, learning how to drive, posing in front of a redwood, and being happy. And the more you learn about these people, the more you realize that they were just that. Real people that were once alive and breathing and had complex lives just like every one of us. But knowing that somehow doesn't make them any less as heroes as they are for thousands of people. In fact, it almost makes them more relatable, which I think is really cool. But that is enough rambling. I hope you all learned something interesting. Thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye.